welcome seekers of hidden knowledge to the mystical realm of the occult. Delve into the secrets of the universe as we journey together into the enigmatic world of ancient wisdom. Brought to you by your guide through the shadows of enlightenment, wisdom rocker. Uncover the mysteries, unlock the power, and journey with us as we explore the hidden depths within the pages of forgotten scrolls and ancient texts. Prepare to embark on a journey beyond the ordinary, where wisdom transcends time and knowledge is your greatest ally. Welcome to Wisdom Rocker. Prepare to awaken your inner sage. In this video, we will be uncovering the wisdom within the chapters of The Theosophical Seal A Study for the Student and the Non-Student by Arthur M. Kuhn With an introduction by James S. Perkins this book is dedicated to all searchers for wisdom. 1958 Book 5 The Interlaced Triangles Chapter 21 The Mystery of the Triangle There are two methods by which any subject may be studied, the deductive and the inductive. One begins with the universal and descends to particulars, the other takes the parts one by one and reconstructs the whole. By the deductive method, we premise a knowledge, at least a theoretical knowledge of the whole, and then proceed from general principles to deduce certain specific truths. The inductive method, on the other hand, takes things as we find them, puts them together and from the parts builds the whole. Universals thus become the sum of all the particulars. The first method might be called the philosophic, because it begins with the premise of certain conclusions, considered as self-evident. The other belongs to the modern scientific method because it takes nothing for granted which cannot stand the test of proof. In a study of symbols such as we are making, we find ourselves using first one method and then the other, or perhaps because of the more or less speculative nature of the subject, the two methods of approach may at times seem to merge. In our immediate study, we shall copy perhaps more closely the scientific approach in that we shall begin with the detail and proceed from that to an overall conclusion. At the same time, we might be accused of bending our lines of thought a little to fit a premise already assumed. That is a risk we shall have to take. Consider the triangle, or any conceivable form for that matter. If we reduce it to its minutest detail, we come to the point the point, having no dimension, has a mathematical existence only. And since it has no physical existence, its figure must be purely hypothetical. Yet all dimensions start with the point, and all forms are extensions of it. It is, therefore, the most appropriate symbol which the mind can conceive as representing the first cause. Since it fills all space and permeates all things, it is the one figure, which suggests infinity or absolute being. The very first act in the process of creation or manifestation is motion. Call it vibration, sound, or the word it is motion. The point of absolute being moves to become manifestation. This movement produces the line. Thus, Another factor appears simultaneously with this act of motion, the factor of duality. A few examples of known phenomena will establish this statement, at least as a working theory. Take matter itself. The scientist tells us that the minutest particle of matter is dual in respect of its properties. That is, it has form or shape and it contains locked within it a force or energy. Consider that familiar phenomenon called electricity. It comes into manifestation as a force only when that mysterious substance becomes divided into two modes of expression called positive and negative. Every schoolboy knows that the Earth is held in its orbit around the Sun by the action of two forces working opposite to each other, the force of attraction and the force of repulsion. So far as the scientist can determine, these twin forces operate throughout the known universe and are responsible for its equilibrium and stability. One force rushes outward from a center, and without an opposing force to restrain it, all objects would perpetually fly apart. The other is a cohesive force. It is the force of attraction or gravitation by which all objects in the universe, however minute or distant, are drawn toward each other. Without the counteraction of the opposing force of repulsion, all things in the universe would be crushed toward a common center. These simple illustrations could be multiplied a thousandfold, but they serve to point out a truth which must be self-evident, namely that whenever manifestation comes into being, whether of a thing or of an idea, that manifestation appears as a duality. But this is only half of the truth. The other half is that with the coming into being of this duality there appears simultaneously a third factor, which is the law or relationship between the two. The whole truth is that manifestation is always and everywhere triple. That this is a law universally inherent in everything, whether physical, mental, or spiritual, we shall attempt to suggest through the illustrations already presented. 
we know that electric current requires two wires, one positive and the other negative. Either one without contact with the other is impotent and harmless. It is only when the two currents are united by means of a switch that power comes into being in the form of light, heat, or energy. The positive and negative currents remain inactive until a flow is made possible by their union. This example illustrates a fundamental law, which is operative at all levels. Take life life in the abstract sense is unthinkable. We cannot recognize or know life unless that life manifests through some form. There must be something which is alive. It is only through the union of life and form in whatever degree that growth or evolution is possible. It is in the constant interplay of matter and energy, or matter and spirit, that all substances become known to man. On the higher levels, it is in the union and interaction of life or spirit with matter or form that consciousness comes into being. We mentioned above two laws or forces, which so far as science knows, exist throughout the whole universe the twin laws of attraction and repulsion, sometimes called centripetal and centrifugal force. Either of these forces without the compensating action of the other would bring immediately chaos. By their union and proper balance a state of equilibrium and law comes into being. It is because of the union of these two opposing forces that the exact position of the moon and earth and all of the planets in relation to the sun can be foretold for thousands of years. The mind can conceive of no object, circumstance or idea which does not fall into this triple category. If we think of the twin concept of time-space, the very conception includes a third element, a relationship which is their measure whether we call it duration, distance or direction. When we think of our objective world as resting upon those twin pillars, matter and energy, we cannot shut from our mind the thought of a law by which the two are inexorably joined. Again, as we think of our world as peopled by the countless types of living creatures, we find a law of polarity into male-female which is the guarantee of the preservation of the species. Throughout the infinite variety of living forms there is found this perpetuating trinity father-mother-offspring. Who is there that cannot say in his heart, I am I or I am the self thus identifying himself by this statement with the very root of being? He looks out upon the universe about him and says, That is not I. As in his long evolution he dissociates himself more and more from his environment, he comes to the time when he looks upon his body, his emotions and even his mind as the not-self himself remaining ever that which is within. With an ever-increasing realization of this distinction, there evolves within his innermost being an increasing awareness of his true relationship with the world outside him. The triangle thus becomes the measure of this relationship between the self and the not-self, there in terms of an expanding consciousness. Expand this idea to embrace the infinite. When God the Universal Father wills to send forth into a world already prepared through aeons of geologic evolution, fragments of himself to become the seeds of a future humanity, there was inherent within each fragment the desire or urge towards an eventual reunion with its source. For long ages, through the lower grades of life, this urge was but dimly felt, so deeply buried was it within the struggles for primitive existence. Gradually this urge began to assert itself in feeble gropings after the unknown and in faint glimmerings of a beyond and of a hereafter. The first primitive religious instinct grew out of these gropings. Down through the ages as mankind evolved, this instinctive desire to search for his origins and to find a destined goal grew into an absorbing passion. The fragment which came forth from the Father like a seed contained within itself the promise of an ultimate fulfillment. As a spring of hope welling up eternally from within the heart of man, this urge of the self to unite or to be bound back, to its source, is the hidden theme of every religion. Herein is revealed another triangle of relationship God-man religion. From this a plan evolves which is universal. It is inherent in all things. It takes shape in the objective world and within our own consciousness. It is the pattern by which all things come into being, both subjectively and in the world outside of us. It is the method of creation, whether in the mind of deity or of man. Even our most abstract thought follows the lines of this threefold pattern, for there must be the thinker, the thought, then the thing thought about. This is the eternal triangle. We visualize the one life or spirit as a point of being entering the circle of manifestation. We visualize also this line of motion as taking two directions as it enters the circle, to form the apex of a triangle. However far these two diverging lines may travel within the circle of manifestation, there exists a definite law of relationship between them. Each line will represent the two aspects of being positive and negative spirit and matter, or force and matter, etc. From this division of the one into two there comes the urge to reunite. This urge or law would form the third side or base of our triangle. Thus our first geometric figure becomes the universal gauge or measure of every creative act, whether that act pertains to the world of things or the world of consciousness.
Thanks for watching the Wisdom Rocker. Don't forget to like, comment, and share.